Tripoli Eastern Equine Encephalitis is leading to changes in scheduling across Connecticut as cities and towns try to keep their citizens inside during prime mosquito biting times. With us, two state senators, Paul Formica, a Republican, and Norm Needleman, a Democrat. And senators, good to have you here in the program today. Good morning. Tripoli good morning. has impacted both of you because you've had victims in both of your districts. And I'll begin with you, Senator Formica. How much of a fear do people in your community have right now? Well, there's a lot of uncertainty and there's a lot of fear uh, because it's in uh, it's in areas that had never been in before. And uh, southeastern Connecticut has always had a few uh, tests positive for these things, but it's never really had a fatality going back to 2013. And East Lyme had one. Uh, in fact, it was a friend of mine. And Old Lyme, uh, both in my district, uh, and not really been tested for. And so people didn't understand that that was you know, the, the threat right there. And how's it being dealt with in your community? What are people saying right now? Well, I'm also the first selectman of Essex, and all of the towns have been advising a school sports to end early. People, you know, put out constant notices about people clothing properly and watching kids, and it's impacted fairs and other events. Um, and I think we still have one person who's on the edge. We're praying that they are okay up in Colchester, and uh, we lost another person in East Haddam. So both of our districts are dramatically impacted. What do you think of the state's response to this? How are they doing in terms of spraying and things like that? And I'll begin with you, Senator Nadelman. So we championed a letter last week together and got 20 other legislators on board um, requesting that the state consider its actions um, and we had a great call with them last Friday there's another one at two o'clock today I think given their resources they've done the best that they can <clears throat> I, I had sort of a secondary motive in wanting to get the groups together and we had commissioners uh, from the Department of Health and deep and AG on the phone um, I don't know if the state has the resources there to really react more quickly than they did to this, and I'm, I'm a little concerned. The threat is diminishing day by day yeah. as the weather grows colder. We need a good, whole, you know, hard, cold frost to kill them off. But what kind of recommendations would you make to the governor for next year? Well, one of the reasons that we did uh, put that letter together to get, uh, was so that we can be prepared for next spring if we, if, uh, we get all the information, the advantages and disadvantages of spring uh, today, because Spraying is most effective with the larvae, and uh, we were concerned that we wanted to show a positive response and perhaps selective aerial or ground spraying may be uh, appropriate this time of year, but it seems like uh, with the weather uh, getting cooler, not yet a frost, uh, the mosquito population is dwindling, and, and the tests are showing that the mosquitoes that do carry this are the ones that feed on birds. Uh, not so much the ones that feed on humans. So, again, be mindful. Places like uh, our restaurant, we're closing uh, the deck uh, for fish. outside dining. Uh, you know, at 5:30, the sporting events are all being done earlier than that. So, be mindful uh, of of all of that and stay inside until this real cold weather hits. Is that the same in Essex? Do you see people? Yeah. You know, the crowds a little bit thinner at nighttime now. Well, we have a big pumpkin festival next next week, and in my district, uh, Portland has um, the big uh, Portland Agricultural mm -hmm. Fair this weekend, which is right on the river. So I, I help facilitate with the first select woman to get deep to allow them to do ground-based spraying. Um, but there's no hard frost coming in the near future, and we have longer seasons now. This is sort of unprecedented weather again. It's not yesterday was one of the warmest days for that time of the year. Uh, so I asked one of the questions was how many people are in the mosquito control unit in the state of Connecticut, and we have three, and that's the entire state. They have part-timers. I think five years ago they had seven. Legislatively come the 2020 session, would you both seek to make some changes so that there's more money for that department, DWP? Well, one of the one of the things that came out of that call was that we need to expand the testing base and, and the opportunities to try to measure more hot spots. And for that, you'll need uh, a little more funding uh, for that. And I think both of us will probably support that kind of uh, initiative. 
while we have you here, I need to shift gears a little bit because the 2020 session is coming up and tolls did not happen this year, but there's big talk that it may happen in 2020. What's your view? Has it changed at all because of the failure to get it passed this year? So I, I was at a uh, presentation done by the governor's chief of staff who's been working all summer on looking at alternatives. I think there's sort of a tacit acknowledgement that the rollout of the plan wasn't good um, and it led to a lot of bad press and a lot of, of negative um, sentiment. I think what they're doing now, which I think is a better approach, is taking the tact of what do we want the state transportation infrastructure to look like in 2030? Let's not just go and ask people for money on day one. Let's talk about a vision. What should we be spending? What, do, what projects do we need to do? Mass transportation, roads and bridges, and then work our way back. Uh, part of that plan might be much more limited tolling and um, federal low interest rate loans. Uh, you know, I'm open-minded and what impressed me this time was talking, starting from the vision and working back and having a conversation about where we want to go and then looking at sources of funding. And I think Democrats and Republicans were in the room and it was uh, received in a much more open-minded, friendly fashion. It wasn't a plan, it was a conversation. Senator Fermiga, since the last session ended, has your view on tolls changed at all? Do you see any room for compromise? Well, there's always room for compromise. And if you go into the legislative session saying there's not, then you shouldn't be in that business. Uh, but the fact of the matter is we, you know, we have been against tolls on my side of the aisle, and I think we laid out a pretty good uh, plan for uh, the reason that we were against them. And now I'm encouraged that the feds have come in. Uh, we've since the beginning talked about let's go to Washington, let's find out what resources we can bring back from Washington. We know we have bridges that need repair, roads that need repair. We just don't want to be sitting on the floor debating them while things happen in a negative way. Republicans wanted a special session to talk about the increase in the prepared meals tax. That did not happen and they're saying that they're going to revisit the issue during the next session. What changes would you like to see? Well, we, we need to be more clear on that. You know, the fact that you're, uh, you know, you're a restaurant, you're selling cooked food, you're adding 1% to the sales tax starting October 1st. Uh, new excised floor tax on liquor. We have to go back and, and uh, inventory the, uh, the alcohol that restaurants have in stock before October 1st and pay a 10% tax on that. We, we need to work on all of these taxes that are, I think, too, too aggressive. And, and, and the meals tax is, is the meals tax, but I don't know why it gets singled out uh, to go in. And if we're going to do this on a grocery tax, we've got to make sure that the law reflects exactly what's going to be taxed and not an interpretation. Senator Neal, I'll give you the last word on this. And, and I thought the interpretation by DRS was a real reach. You know, as we discussed the budget on our side, the, the conversation was whatever was taxed as prepared food at um, the rate that we currently have, we're going to add 1%. Um, and I supported that. Beyond that, I didn't support any kind of grocery tax, nor do I think that that's a good approach. Norm Needleman, Paul Formica, Senators both, we thank you so much for being in the program today. Thank you. Have a good Sunday. Thank you. In a moment, how long do you think you will live? It could depend on where in Connecticut you live. That's coming up next. And I welcome you to follow me right now on social media, Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. I'm on all three.